Part 1, Chapter 1 of Quiet Talks on Prayer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Quiet Talks on Prayer by S. D. Gordon. Part 1 The Meaning and Mission of Prayer. Chapter 1 Prayer the Greatest Outlet of Power. Five Outlets of Power. A great sorrow has come into the heart of God. Let it be told only in hushed voice. One of his worlds is a prodigal. Hush your voice yet more. Ours is that prodigal world. Let your voice soften down still more. We have consented to the prodigal part of the story. But in softest tones yet, he has won some of us back with his strong, tender love. And now let the voice ring out with great gladness. We one ones may be the pathway back to God for the others. That is his earnest desire. That should be our dominant ambition. For that purpose he has endowed us with peculiar power. There is one inlet of power in the life, anybody's life, any kind of power. Just one inlet, the Holy Spirit. He is power. He is in every one who opens his door to God. He eagerly enters every open door. He comes in by our invitation and consent. His presence within is the vital thing. But with many of us, while he is in, he is not in control. In as guest, not as host. That is to say, he is hindered in his natural movements, tied up so that he cannot do what he would do and so we are not conscious or only partially conscious of his presence, and others are still less so. But to yield to his mastery, to cultivate his friendship, to give him full swing, that will result in what is called power. One inlet of power, the Holy Spirit in control. There are five outlets of power, five avenues through which this one within shows himself and reveals his power. First, through the life, what we are, just simply what we are. If we be right, the power of God will be constantly flowing out, though we be not conscious of it. It throws the keenest kind of emphasis on a man being right in his life. There will be an eager desire to serve, yet we may constantly do more in what we are, than in what we do. We may serve better in the lives we live than in the best service we ever give. The memory of that should bring rest to your spirit when a bit tired, and may be disheartened because tired. Second, through the lips, what we say. It may be said stammeringly and falteringly, but if said your best with the desire to please the Master, it will be God-blessed. I have heard a man talk, and he stuttered and blushed, and got his grammar badly tangled, but my heart burned as I listened. And I have heard a man talk with smooth speech, and it rolled off me as easily as it rolled out of him. Do your best, and leave the rest. If we are in touch with God, his fire burns, whether the tongue stammer, or has good control of its powers. Third, through our service, what we do. It may be done bunglingly and blunderingly. Your best may not be the best, but if it be your best, it will bring a harvest. Fourth, through our money, what we do not keep but loosen out for God. Money comes the nearest to omnipotence of anything we handle. And fifth, through our prayer, what we claim in Jesus' name. And by all odds, the greatest of these is the outlet through prayer. The power of a life touches just one spot, but the touch is tremendous. What is there we think to be compared with a pure, unselfish, gently strong life? Yet its power is limited to one spot where it is being lived. Power through the lips depends wholly upon the life back of the lips. Words that come brokenly, are often made burning and eloquent by the life behind them, and words that are smooth and easy 
often have all their meaning sapped by the life back of them. Power through service may be great, and may be touching many spots, yet it is always less than that of a life. Power through money depends wholly upon the motive back of the money. Begrudged money, stained money, soils the treasury. That which comes nearest to omnipotence also comes nearest to impotence. But the power loosened out through prayer is as tremendous at the least, to say no more just now, is as tremendous as the power of a true fragrant life, and, mark you, and, may touch not one spot, but wherever in the whole round world you may choose to turn it. The greatest thing any one can do for God and for man is to pray. It is not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. A correct balancing of the possible powers one may exert puts it first, for if a man is to pray right, he must first be right in his motives and life, and if a man be right, and put the practice of praying in its right place, then his serving and giving and speaking will be fairly fragrant with the presence of God. The great people of the earth today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer, nor those who say they believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain about prayer, but I mean these people who take time and pray. They have not time. It must be taken from something else. This something else is important, very important and pressing than prayer. There are people that put prayer first and group the other items in life schedule around and after prayer. These are the people today who are doing the most for God in winning souls, in solving problems, in awakening churches, in supplying both men and money for mission posts, in keeping fresh and strong these lives far off in sacrificial service on the foreign field where the thickest fighting is going on, in keeping the old earth sweet a while longer. It is wholly a secret service. We do not know who these people are, though sometimes shrewd guesses may be made. I often think that sometimes we pass some plain-looking woman quietly slipping out of church, gown been turned two or three times, bonnet fixed over more than once, hands that have not known much of the softening of gloves, and we hardly ever give her a passing thought, and do not know nor guess that perhaps she is the one who is doing far more for her church and for the world and for God than a hundred who would claim more attention and more thought, because she prays, truly prays, as the Spirit of God inspires and guides. Let me put it this way. God will do as a result of the praying of the humblest one here what otherwise he would not do. Yes, I can make it stronger than that, and I must make it stronger, for the book does. Listen, God will do in answer to the prayer of the weakest one here what otherwise he could not do. Oh, someone thinks, you're getting that too strong now. Well, you listen to Jesus' own words in that last long quiet talk he had with the eleven men between the upper room and the olive green. John preserves much of that talk for us. Listen, ye did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that ye should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, that, listen, a part of the purpose why we have been chosen, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. John chapter 15 verse 16 Mark that word may, not shall this time, but may. Shall throws the matter over on God, his purpose. May throws it over upon us, our cooperation. That is to say, our praying makes it possible for God to do what otherwise he could not do. And if you think into it a bit, that fits in with the true conception of prayer. In its simplest analysis, prayer, all prayer, has, must have, two parts. 
First, a God to give. Yes, you say, certainly, a God wealthy, willing, and all of that. And just as certainly there must be a second factor, a man to receive. Man's willingness is God's channel to the earth. God never crowds nor coerces. Everything God does for man and through man, He does with man's consent, always. With due reverence, but very plainly, let it be said that God can do nothing for the man with the shut hand and the shut life. There must be an open hand and heart and life through which God can give what He longs to. An open life, an open hand, open upward, is the pipeline of communication between the heart of God and this poor, befooled old world. Our prayer is God's opportunity to get into the world that would shut him out. In touch with a planet. Prayer opens a whole planet to a man's activities. I can as really be touching hearts for God in faraway India or China through prayer as though I were there, not in as many ways as though there, but as truly. Understand me, I think the highest possible privilege of service is in those far-off lands. There the need is greatest, the darkness densest, and the pleading call most eloquently pathetic. And if one may go there, happy man, if one be privileged to go to the honoured place of service, he may then use all five outlets direct in the spot where he is. Yet this is only one spot, but his relationship is as wide as his master's and his sympathies should be. A man may be in Africa, but if his heart be in touch with Jesus, it will be burning for a world. Prayer puts us into direct, dynamic touch with a world. A man may go aside today and shut his door, and as really spend a half hour in India, I am thinking of my words as I say them, it seems so much to say, and yet it is true, as really spend a half hour of his life in India for God, as though he were there in person. Is that true? If it be true, surely you and I must get more half hours for this secret service. Without any doubt, he may turn his key and be for a bit of time as potentially in China by the power of prayer as though they are in actual bodily form. I say potentially present, of course not consciously present, but in the power exerted upon men he may be truly present at the objective point of his prayer. He may give a new meaning to the printed page being read by some native down in Africa. He may give a new tongue of flame to the preacher or teacher, he may make it easier for men to accept the story of Jesus and then to yield themselves to Jesus. Yonder men swept and swayed by evil spirits and by prejudices for generations make it easier for them to accept the story and, if need be, to cut with loved ones and step out and up into a new life. Some earnest heart enters an objection here, perhaps, you are thinking that if you were there, you could influence men by your personal contact, by the living voice. So you could, and there must be the personal touch. Would that there were many times more going for that blessed personal touch. But this is a thing to mark keenly, both for those who may go and for those who must stay. No matter where you are, you do more through your praying than through your personality. If you were in India, you could add your personality to your prayer. That would be a great thing to do. But whether there or here, you must first win the victory, every step, every life, every foot of the way, in secret, in the spirit realm, and then add the mighty touch of your personality in service. You can do more than pray after you have prayed but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. And just there is where we have all seemed to make a slip at times, and many of us are yet making it a bad slip. We think we can do more where we are through our service, 
then prayer to give power to service. No, with the blackest underscoring of emphasis let it be said, no, we can do no thing of real power until we have done the prayer thing. Here is a man by my side. I can talk to him. I can bring my personality to bear upon him, that I may win him. But before I can influence his will a jot for God, I must first have won the victory in the secret place. Intercession is winning the victory over the chief, and service is taking the field after the chief is driven off. Such service is limited by the limitation of personality to one place. This spirit telegraphy, called prayer, puts a man into direct dynamic touch with a planet. There are some of our friends who think themselves of the practical sort, who say, The great thing is work. Prayer is good and right, but the great need is to be doing something practical. The truth is that when one understands about prayer, and puts prayer in its right place in his life, he finds a new motive power burning in his bones to be doing, and further he finds that it is the doing that grows out of praying that is mightiest in touching human hearts, and he finds further yet with a great joy that he may be doing something for an entire world. His service becomes as broad as his master's thought. Intercession is service. It helps greatly to remember that intercession is service, the chief service of a life on God's plan. It is unlike all other forms of service, and superior to them in this, that it has fewer limitations. In all other service we are constantly limited by space, bodily strength, equipment, material obstacles, difficulties involved in the peculiar differences of personality. Prayer knows no such limitations. It ignores space. It may be free of expenditure of bodily strength, where rightly practised, and one's powers are under proper control. It goes directly, by the telegraphy of spirit, into men's hearts, quietly passes through walls and past locks unhindered, and comes into most direct touch with the inner heart and will to be affected. In service, as ordinarily understood, one is limited to the space where his body is, and the distance his voice can reach, the length of time he can keep going before he must quit to eat, or rest, or sleep. He is limited by walls and locks, by the prejudices of men's minds, and by those peculiar differences of temperament which must be studied in laying siege to men's hearts. The whole circle of endeavour in winning men includes such an infinite variety. There is speaking the truth to a number of persons, and to one at a time. The doing of needed kindly acts of helpfulness, supplying food and the like. There is teaching, the almost omnipotent ministry of money, the constant contact with a pure, unselfish life, letter-writing, printer's ink in endless variety. All these are in God's plan for winning men. But the intensely fascinating fact to mark is this, that the real victory in all of this service is won in secret, beforehand, by prayer, and these other indispensable things are the moving upon the works of the enemy and claiming the victory already won. And when these things are put in their proper order, prayer first, and the other things second, second, I say, not omitted, not slurred over, done with all the earnestness and power of brain and hand and heart possible, but done after the victory has been won in secret against the real foe, and done while the winner is still claiming the victory already assured, then will come far greater achievements in this outer, open service. Then we go into this service with that fine spirit of expectancy that sweeps the field at the start, and steadily sticks on the stubbornly contested spots until the whipped foe turns tail and goes. Prayer is striking the winning blow at the concealed enemy. Service is gathering up the results of that blow among the men we see and touch. Great patience and tact and persistence are needed in the service, 
because each man must be influenced in his own will. But the shrewd strategy that wins puts the keen, stiff, secret fighting first. THE SPIRIT SWITCHBOARD Electricity is a strange element. It is catalogued in the study of physics. It is supposed to be properly classed among the forces of nature. Yet it seems to have many properties of the spirit world. Those who know most of it say they know least what it is. Some of the laws of its being have been learned, and so its marvellous power harnessed for man's use, but in much ignorance of what it is. It seems almost to belong somewhere in between the physical and the spirit realms. It furnishes many similes of graphic helpfulness in understanding more nearly much truth of the spirit life. In the powerhouse where the electricity is being wooed into man's harnessing, or generated, as the experts say, is found a switchboard, or switch room, with a number of boards. Here, in a large city plant, a man may go and turn a switch, that is, move a little handle, a very short distance. It is a very simple act, easily performed, involving almost no strength. But that act has loosened the power in the house back of the switchboard, out along the wires, and perhaps lighted a whole section of the city. He goes in again at another hour, and turns this set of switches, and this and sets in motion maybe scores of cars, carrying swiftly hundreds of passengers. Again he goes in, and moves the little handles, and sets in motion the wheels in some factory, employing hundreds of operatives. It is a secret service, usually as far as any observers are concerned. It is a very quiet, matter-of-fact service, but the power influenced is unmeasured and immeasurable, and no one seemingly thus far can explain the mysterious but tremendous agent involved. Does the fluid, is it a fluid, or what, pass through the wire or around the wire? The experts say they do not know, but the laws which it obeys are known, and as men comply with them its almost omnipotence is manifested. Just such a switch-room in the spirit realm is one's prayer-room, Everyone who will may have such a spirit switchboard in his life. There he may go, and in compliance with the laws of the power used, loosen out the gracious, persuasive, irresistible power of God, where he wills to, now in Japan, now in China, among the hungry human hearts of India's plains and mountains, again in Africa, which is full as near to where Jesus sits as is England or America, and now into the house across the alley from your home, and down in the slum district, and now into your preacher's heart for next Sunday's work, and now again into the hearts of those you'll be meeting in the settlement house or the mission school. Children are not allowed at the electricity switchboard, nor any unskilled hand, for misuse means possibility of great damage to property and life, and the spirit switchboard does not yield to the unskilled touch, though sometimes there seems to be much tampering by those with crude fingers and with selfish desire to turn this current to personal advantage merely. It takes skill here, yet such is our winsome God's wondrous plan that skill may come to anyone who is willing, simply that who is willing, and it comes very simply too. Strange too, as with the electrical counterpart, the thing is beyond full or satisfying explanation. How does it come to pass that a man turns a few handles, and miles away great wheels begin to revolve, and enormous power is manifested? Will someone kindly explain? Yet we know it is so, and men govern their actions by that knowledge. How does it come to pass that a woman in Iowa, prays for the conversion of her sceptical husband, and he, down in the thick of the most absorbing congress Washington has known since the Civil War, and in full ignorance of her purpose, becomes conscious and repeatedly conscious of the presence and power of the God in whose existence he does not believe. 
and months afterwards, with his keen, legally trained mind, finds the calendar to fit together the beginning of her praying with the beginning of his unwelcome consciousness. Will someone kindly explain? Ah, who can adequately? Yet the facts, easily ascertainable, are there, and evidenced in the complete change in the life and calling of the man. How comes it to pass that a woman in Missouri, praying for a friend of keen intellectual scepticality in Glasgow, who can skillfully measure and parry argument, yet finds afterwards that the time of her praying is the time of his, at first decidedly unwelcome, but finally radical change of convictions. Yet groups of thoughtful men and women know these two instances to be even so, though unable to explain how. And as the mysterious electrical power is being used by obedience to its laws, even so is the power of prayer being used by many who understand simply enough of its laws to obey and to bring the stupendous results. THE BROAD INNER HORIZON This suggests at once that the rightly rounded Christian life has two sides, the outside and the inner side. To most of us the outer side seems the greater. The living, the serving, the giving, the doing, the absorption in life's work, the contact with men, with the great majority, the sheer struggle for existence, these take the greater thought and time of us all. They seem to be the great business of life, even to those of us who thoroughly believe in the inner life. But when the real eyes open, the inner eyes that see the unseen, the change of perspective is first ludicrous, then terrific, then pathetic. Ludicrous because of the change of proportions, terrific because of the issues at stake, pathetic because of strong men that see not, and push on spending splendid strength whittling sticks. The outer side is narrow in its limits. It has to do with food and clothing, bricks and lumber, time and the passing hour, the culture of the mind, the joys of social contact, the smoothing of the way for the suffering. And it needs not to be said that these are right, they belong in the picture, they are its physical background. The inner side includes all of these, and stretches infinitely beyond. Its limits are broad, broad as the home of man, with its enswathing atmosphere added. It touches the inner spirit. It moves in upon the motives, the loves, the heart. It moves out upon the myriad spirit beings and forces that swarm ceaselessly about the earth, staining and sliming men's souls and lives. It moves up to the arm of God in cooperation with his great love plan for a world. Shall we follow for a day one who has gotten the true perspective? Here is the outer side, a humble home, a narrow circle, tending the baby, patching, sewing, cooking, calling, or measuring dry goods, chopping a typewriter, checking up a ledger, feeding the swift machinery, endless stitching, gripping a locomotive lever, pushing the plough, tending the stock, doing the chores, tiresome examination papers, and all the rest of the endless, endless doing day by day of the commonplace treadmill things that must be done, that fill out the day of the great majority of human beings. This one whom we are following unseen is doing quietly, cheerily his daily round, with a bit of sunshine in his face, a light in his eye, a lightness in his step, and the commonplace place becomes uncommon by reason of the presence of this man with the uncommon spirit. He is working for God. No, better, he is working with God, he has an unseen friend at his side. That changes all. The common drudgery ceases to be common, and ceases to be drudgery, because it is done with an uncommon master. That is the outer, the narrow side of this life, not narrow in itself, but in its proportion to the whole. 
Now hold your breath and look, for here is the inner side where the larger work of life is being done. Here is the quiet bit of time alone with God, with the book. The door is shut, as the Master said. Now it is the morning hour with a bit of made light, for the sun is busy yet farther east. Now it is the evening hour, with the sun speeding towards western service, and the bed invitingly near. There is a looking up into God's face, then keen but reverent reading, and then a simple, intelligent pleading, with its many variations of this, Thy will be done in the victor's name. God himself is here, in this inner room. The angels are here. The room opens out into and is in direct touch with a spirit space as wide as the earth. The horizon of this room is as broad as the globe. God's presence with this man makes it so. Today a half hour is spent in China for its missionaries, its native Christians, its millions, the printed page, the personal contact, the telling of the story, the school, the dispensary, the hospital. And in through the petitions runs this golden thread, Victory in Jesus' name, victory in Jesus' name, today, today. Thy will be being done, the other will undone, victory in Jesus' name. Tomorrow's bit of time is largely spent in India, perhaps, and so this man with the narrow outer horizon and the broad inner horizon pushes his spirit way through Japan, India, Ceylon, Persia, Arabia, Turkey, Africa, Europe's papal lands, the South American states, the homeland, its cities, frontiers, slums, the hometown, the home church, the man across the alley, in and out, out and in, the tide of prayer sweeps quietly, resistlessly, day by day. This is the true Christian life. This man is winning souls and refreshing lives in these far-off lands and in nearby places, as truly as though he were in each place. This is the Master's plan. The true follower of Jesus has as broad a horizon as his Master. Jesus thought in continents and seas. His follower prays in continents and seas. This man does not know what is being accomplished. Yes, he does know, too. He knows by the inference of faith. This room where we are meeting and talking together might be shut up so completely that no light comes in. A single crack breaking somewhere lets in a thin line of light. But that line of light, shining in the darkness, tells of a whole sun of light flooding the outer world. There comes to this man occasional yes, frequent, evidences of changes being wrought. Yet he knows that these are but the thin line of glory light which speaks of the fuller shining, and with a spirit touched with glad awe that he can and may help God, and a heart full alike of peace and of yearning, and a life fragrant with an unseen presence, he goes steadily on his way towards the dawning of the day. End of part one, chapter one.